Yep. Uh oh. All right. Welcome uh, to the fourth installment of the Kentucky Elk Hunting webinar series. Um, if you watched episode with the Kentucky Elk Guides Association, you may remember that we talked briefly uh, about the archery setups for elk. So in this episode, we plan to take a little bit deeper dive into archery hunting um, and some things to think about when you're gearing up uh, to practice this summer and to, per to prepare for the hunt this fall. Uh, so again, we've got Joe and I, and we've also got two guests with us today. Um, so first off, I'll start with Gabe. So we've got Gabe Jenkins. Uh, he is currently the Acting Information and Education Division Director and a recent uh, Deer and Elk Program Coordinator. Um, so he's also an experienced Western elk archery hunter. So Gabe, if you don't mind taking just a minute and uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your archery experience. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate you letting us come on here tonight and talk about something I'm super passionate about, um, elk hunting. Um, I've been out west and archery hunted elk a lot. Um, I've taken five elk with my bow over the last, uh, last time frame in a couple of western states. And uh, man, it's just nothing better than hunting elk in September with a bow and, and got a lot of experience. Uh, you know, with that experience comes some of the good and the bad. And hopefully we can, can discuss some things to think about to help you be prepared for success tonight. Absolutely, man. Thanks for, thanks for being with us. Uh, so we're also lucky enough this evening to have Kenton Bottoms. Um, and he's one of uh, Joe and I's good buddies. I, I ruined him on one of his first duck hunting trips down to Kentucky Lake with me. Um, it's not been the same since for you, I'm sure. <laughs> That's right. But, but uh, either way, so Kenton was an archery tech at Sportsman's Warehouse for a number of years, and I know that he's personally responsible for keeping Joe's equipment running um, as, as best as possible. So take a minute and introduce yourself if you don't mind. Uh, so I'm Kenton Bottoms. Uh, like you said, I was a archery tech at Sportsman's Warehouse for a number of years. So um, I've been, also been archery hunting since I was like, I don't know, 14, 15 years old. So a good 16, 17 years, probably. I don't know. I can't do the math on that. But either way, um, uh, and, you know, I while I haven't like hunted elk with archery equipment before, I have helped a lot of people get set up to hunt elk with their archery equipment. So that's kind of, uh, I guess, where I fit in or my niche uh, is I have experience with like actually getting people set up to go out and be successful in elk hunting. Yeah, I, I definitely, I got a feeling when when stuff like uh, the word tuning, uh, tuning your bow, which is, I still don't know how that works. Uh, I feel like when that comes up, we're gonna, we're gonna pitch it to you. Um, and then also, so everybody's met Joe, if you've listened to any of our other episodes, but uh, just briefly, he does have some Western elk hunting experience. So he's, you know, here's a good photo of him standing over the elk that he killed in 2019. Yeah, with yeah. a bow that Kenton set up for me. With a bow that, that Kenton set up for him. So uh, just, to, just to put that one up there, so... Either way, um, we're, we're lucky to have these two guys, and I think between uh, Joe, Gabe, and Kenton, we got a great group of people that have that have slung some arrows out west, and that, that we can certainly, uh, you know, help folks get up to a little better speed than they are on uh, on archery hunting. So, I will tell you that I am personally looking forward to this conversation because you know, looking forward to the fall and a possible elk hunt. I'm very much in the same boat that I would say a lot of our drawn hunters are. Um, so I came into arch archery hunting pretty late in life. Um, I've really only owned a, a proper hunting bow since last October. Um, and a big part of that is just to capitalize on, you know, the archery hunting opportunities that are out there. Um, and so I'm the type of person that likes to think about gear and, and research that stuff online. And I was absolutely driven crazy by the volume of info that is out there on the web. That's on YouTube. Uh, just like, you know, I'm, I, I was starting completely bare, you know, had to buy everything. Um, and it was basically one of those things that it was, it was information overload essentially. And it was frustrating because as you know, we talked about before we, hit the record button, there's a lot of uh, personal opinion that's in all these things. Um, and it just, being able to sort through that. And eventually in my, you know, my idea was I've got a good buddy that's a bow tech in West Kentucky. And I just said, what do I need? 
Like, you know, I'm going to come in there one day and, and just start me out somewhere. Maybe in 10 years from now, I can start getting picky about what I've got. But uh, that was kind of where I was at. Um, and then kind of another, I guess, another cautionary tale when we're thinking about equipment. So I had a muzzleloader tag in Colorado last year. Their muzzleloader regs are very different from ours. It's, you know, it's open sites. It's a different setup. And I did not get started on that early enough. I should have been shooting that gun in January and February. I let it get to June and July. And I was still ordering different peep sites in like the first part of August. And what that essentially did, and I eventually got it dialed and got confident, which we'll talk about as we go, but that just adds to the stress of, of the preparations. Uh, so we wanted to hit this video early. Um, you know, people got a couple months over the summer to really get dialed in, but do that and jump on it early and get your equipment dialed as we go through this. So Essentially today, I'm going to more or less play the role of the, of the inexperienced uh, archery hunter, which I am. Um, so these are a lot of questions that I've asked these guys uh, over the last couple months, thinking for the fall. So I'm going to play that role and just we're going to we've got a list of topics that we want to cover, but I'm going to sort of pitch them as like, help me think about what I want to carry into the woods in, in September. So I think it's pretty applicable to, uh, to our drawn hunters. So I think the easy, I think the easy start and uh, we can kind of pass this around to whoever wants, wants it is just tips for a proper bow setup. And, you know, the good majority of our people probably have, have outfits for, for whitetail. So in terms of elk hunting, talk to me about the poundage I need to be pulling, draw length, and then we'll kind of get into some of the different, some of the different gear. And you can also speak, you know, Joe and Joe and Gabe have bows that are set up specifically for elk that I know they in turn use for whitetail and turkey and that other stuff. So maybe add in how that can all kind of play together. And I'll, I'll I, you're up, Gabe. <laughs> all right. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll start it off. So, you know, you mentioned one, I'll address it first uh, is draw length. So um, the biggest thing is go to an archery shop, somebody who deals with archery and get measured, make sure that you're shooting the correct bow, you know, your buddy's bow that they hand you, that you've never maybe picked up or, you know, they gave it to you and you've been shooting it. That might not be the correct length for you. So, I mean, it's all based upon your, your arm length and your shoulder width and how you stand. So go get that check to make sure that you have the right draw length, the, the bow fits you properly. Um, so that would be the first thing. Once you know that you've got the right draw length for your bow, then it, it's kind of working through some of those other details. You know, poundage, I'm a big fan of pulling as much weight as you possibly can, but still being comfortable with that shot. So, you know, we talked a little bit before we kicked this off and, you know, when you're cold or when you're really hot or you got a bunch of clothes on, you're sitting in a seat or on your knees, you need to practice all of those first to see what can I comfortably do to pull it back naturally and also hold it? I mean, you don't want this huge, big, uncomfortable mm -hmm. to be smooth, just like you practice, like you're standing. Um, and, and, you know, as you shoot and you practice, you're also going to get stronger. So, you know, if you're, if you're a new archer, you have a lot of uh, new muscles that are going to have to learn how to pull and pull correctly. They're going to be weak. So they're going to strengthen up as time goes along. So if you picked up that bow now and you've not shot in a couple months or years, you're, you're going to be struggling early on. But as those muscles learn and you get some of that muscle memory built, you could potentially increase your, uh, increase your draw weight at that point. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. So I was, I was, I was hell bent on killing a turkey with my bow this year and I, I pull 70 pounds pretty easy standing up. Well, when I got on my knees to shoot out of a little blind that I've got or sitting on my rear end, it's a whole nother ball game with, with that weight. Um, and then, so tell me, so, I mean, I'm looking at the four of us, we all probably got some pretty decent draw lengths. What is, what's the advantage? I mean, what do we get out of that? If you've got, or I should say, you know, somebody that's got a shorter draw length, what are they losing in that draw length when it comes to the combination of like draw length and poundage? So somebody with a shorter draw length, is going to essentially get less feet per second out of the bow. But that's not a killer. That's not 
That's not mean if you have a short draw and you can't be successful. It doesn't mean that at all. Um, there are things you can do with your arrows and other things to kind of overcome that. And, you know, I know that there's a big craze these days, and it's about speed, speed, speed. Everybody wants the fastest bow, the fastest bow. I want the fastest bow, I want the lightest arrows. When it comes to hunting elk, that is not what you want. Speed does not kill elk. What does is penetration. Elk are very, very large animals, and they're very tough animals. So penetration is the key. So don't get caught up if you're a shorter person or somebody who has just a shorter drawing, or maybe you're a taller person, but you can't pull as much poundage. Don't necessarily worry about that. I would, I would rather have less draw length and less poundage and still be able to hit the spot. If you can hit the spot within the spot and put the arrow where it needs to go and you have a proper arrow set up, you can be very successful. So just that's one of the things I like to say, don't get caught up on speed 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 it's not all about speed and that's like and you know um gabe just said you know about uh pulling back as much as you can comfortably and that's one of those things that it's important because you want to be as ethical as you can and the higher the poundage you can pull and stuff in theory the more ethical you can be but you have to make sure you can do that comfortably so one thing i like to do and this is something you can try at home is you can get a chair or a stool as best if you get like a, a stool that you can like have your feet kind of up on the rung of a stool and sit there. And if you can sit there and you can pull, pull your bow back and keeping your, your arm that's holding the bow parallel to the ground and you can pull that bow straight back and hold it back like that without falling off that stool or wiggling, wobbling around or doing a bunch of crazy movements, then you're probably, you're probably at a good draw weight. You might could go up more if it's too easy. If it's very easy to do that, you can go up more. But that's a good test and that's what I like to do to kind of get me ready. Cause I know if I can sit on top of a stool and draw that bow back, then I can sit down and draw it. I can draw it when I'm cold. I can draw it when I have more, you know, you can draw it in a bunch of adverse conditions. Yeah. So one thing I was going to point out too, you know, Kenton was talking about speed and for the whitetail hunter, that's what you're looking for. We all, if you're, if you're an archer, that's a whitetail hunter, you hear the horror stories of that deer duck in that string because they hear it. Just in the natural behavior of an elk versus a deer, Deer are a lot more high strung. They hear that stuff. They're more keen to that. An elk doesn't have that quick of a reflex. They're more inquisitive. They're a little slower to movement. Um, so you can get by with a little bit slower just because they're not as high strung. You don't see, it's not as typical for them to duck a string, if you will. So, you know, that's one thing to point out. Just the behavior of the animals allows for you to, to pull some more weight to slow that speed down and be fine. I mean, and People have been killing elk with bows for 40 years. I mean, the technology we're using right now, even the cheapest bow on the shelf is better than what they were shooting 20 years ago. So, you know, it's really advanced. Yep. Yep. For sure. One, uh, one consideration about the, the draw weight that I, I try to keep in mind, and it's not necessarily about the weight, but about the bow is, is how long you can, you can comfortably keep it pulled back. Um, sometimes they come in slow. You think they're on a string and, Oh, they, they stop and look at you or stop and look at something and you're sitting there going, oh, so I like to have something that I can, I can keep comfortably pulled back for, I mean, as long as you can, but I try to shoot for at least a minute um, where, you know, I'm not coming unglued and, and, you know, have to let down right in the, in the heat of the moment. Cause you work hard to get those opportunities and, you know, you want to make the most of them when you can and you'd hate to, to get something that's got no let off and, you know, you can't pull until he's right there and, it's just a consideration I like to, to make. Listen, I mean, when that elk's within 40 yards and bugling his brains out, you're going to lose it on everything. So adding that extra <laughs> on top of that just puts more stress on it. So yeah. it's going to be a high-stress environment. So anything you can do to help, help stack the deck and make you a little more comfortable in that, that's the key. All right. I'm with you. And all right, so going back to, to getting myself set up last fall and just looking at looking at the YouTubes, and uh, a lot of the folks elk hunting out west, the slider sites, that was like, in my mind, you know, it basically, so that'd be basically a single pin that, that, that slides versus the multi pin that I'd always seen. And that's ultimately what I went, what I ended up going with just to eliminate a step from the process. Um, and so what, Give us a give us a quick, you know, what do y'all use? Is there what's the advantage to one over the other? I can so, speak to this one if you all. <laughs> um, I, I personally, it's all in what you're comfortable with, um, but 
when I was starting archery hunting around the time Kenton was when I was 14, 15, I, uh, I had target panic really, really bad. And when you have all of those different pins, the multi pin sites, you know, I might know if that deer is 25 yards away, but you just, you know, it's like, Oh, well, which one exactly do I put it on? Um, I found that was pretty challenging for me. And, uh, it also, I felt like it kind of crowded my target, uh, when you have all the pins across. So I personally, um, have been much more successful and much more comfortable shooting with the single pin site, but that's just personally me. Um, but it requires you to focus on one small thing. You know, you don't have other things in your way. And um, I was talking to a, a, an outfitter about this the other day. And, and uh, you know, they say, especially these guys who've never elk hunted with multi pin sites, they, they kind of get a little bit of panic in them and they'll, you know, they'll put their uh, top pin on the elk's back, their bottom pin on the, elk's chest I'm like well he's covered up i'm going to hit him somewhere right like that's why i personally like the single pin site it just helps me dial in on a specific thing but again it's everybody's preference and if you practice with your bow enough and you know what it'll do like for my setup um, when i hunt now i basically keep my pin set at 20 yards but i've shot enough and i know my bow that my point of aim at that 20 yard pin basically covers me from 10 to 40 yards which is going to cover most of my hunting situations you know if it's an uh, an elk that's a little bit further than that that i probably wouldn't shoot anyway you know chances are i'm going to have time to make that quick adjustment but for the majority of my shots especially elk hunting or or deer hunting that i'm doing um that that setup works really well for me and it allows me to just focus exactly on what i need to focus on yeah yeah, that, that makes sense. And, it, you know, that was one of the things going when I drew back on that turkey this year, one of the things going through my head, I was like green pin, like, you know, turkey yep. was at 18 yards. That's my 20 yard pin. And it just constantly, and I don't even have another green pin and the whole, you know, the whole five pin setup. And it was just like, that was just one more thing I had to think about. So it's got me thinking about the, about the, single pin a little bit you, you can really it's amazing no matter how much you practice uh, when you're in that different situation how much you can actually second guess like oh was that yellow pin my 30 yard or i don't uh, i don't really remember yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that i mean honestly and I'll, I'll say it joe called that turkey in for me that was my entire reason to want to mm -hmm. turkey hunt with a bow as crazy as that sounds is to like i have no idea what i am like with a bow in that situation perfectly fine with a gun know where the safety's at no you know no problem but just putting myself in that stressful situation made you know the the fact that it worked out uh, was great but it uh gave me about 100 more things to think about than i thought i had before so uh just more practice essentially anybody else got anything on that one if not we'll move to to releases because that's something that i've that i've been seeing a lot of different stuff out there um mainly in I, i'm basically shooting one with a wrist strap which really was not I, great i was going to say that the key. yeah go ahead i think somebody would got froze a little bit yeah sorry it was me am i coming in clear now yep you're mm -hmm. good okay so i was just going to show you know joe likes the single pin um i have a single pin for turkey hunting and white tail hunting here but out west, I've got a seven pin site that I use out west. Um, it's, it's got a level on it. That's my preferred preferred method because you're going to be in, in bigger, country, potentially longer shots. Um, you know, I think the ultimate thing for everybody to think about is practice, 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 practice. No matter what we're telling you, you got to practice. And as you practice, you'll find things that you like and that you don't like that make sense for you. Just like what Joe was talking about. He had target, target panic, so he started changing some stuff up, and then he kind of found his sweet spot. So that's the challenge in all this, that most of the time when you go to an archery shop and purchase your first bow, it's probably not going to be perfect for you. You're going to have to work through some things, so that's why we're doing this now and telling you to practice so you can figure that out. You don't want to be figuring out your equipment during hunt. Yep. Yep, that makes sense. Um. So kind of kind of back to releases. So I'm shooting a regular old uh, wrist strap with a with a with a trigger on it, and I really found out that I tend to just want to slap that trigger. 
you know, and when I'm really dialed in and hitting good at it, you know, when I kind of stretch it out to 50 yards and I'm hitting good, it's because I am completely surprised. I'm squeezing that trigger and it's just, everything works perfect. You know, I can be, I can be six or eight inches off if I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. Um, and so I've been looking, uh, you know, the thumb, the thumb releases are, are interesting. There's a lot of the uh, releases now that are just tension, basically back tension release. And I'm sort of on the fence of, of spending a little money and, and trying some of those other options. But um, I don't know. That might be a good one for Kenton. So I will tell you, I've seen a lot of people shoot a lot of different releases. And what I like to tell people is, absolutely it's about what you're comfortable with but something to take into consideration because i've had people come to me and they're like oh you know i just bought this brand new back tension release you know this thing's so sweet they go shoot it they shoot fine at a target well then i see them halfway through deer season oh man i had the biggest buck of my life come out i went to draw and punched myself in the nose <coughs> because i wasn't I wasn't comfortable, you know, you get to shaking and stuff. And those are very, very finicky releases. Like it doesn't take much to set one of those off, depending on how you got it set. And it's one of those things I kind of try and tell people, I personally, and this is me, there's a bunch of people that do hunt with them, do just fine. Personally, me, I do not want to hunt with one because I do not want to punch myself in the face and knock myself out while I'm trying to <laughs> harvest it and a once in a lifetime elk. But with that said, there are different things and different releases that can kind of give you that same feel. The thumb releases, they're very good because you can kind of shoot them in a way that they act like a back tension release by holding your thumb in a you know at a certain angle, and then you kind of squeeze the shoulder blades to make your thumb engage that roller that uh, that is the trigger on that release. Um, personally, I shoot a wrist strap style um, finger trigger release, but the way that I get around slapping the trigger is I have like, when I go to shoot my bow, there's like a step, a checklist basically that is, I don't have to think about it anymore, but it came from practicing. And so I know that when I get my bow back and I get anchored up, everything just feels right. And I can tell that I'm where I need to be. And my hand kind of just lays limp across the trigger. And then it's kind of the same thing. I kind of squeeze the shoulder blades back and that's what causes my release. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you do want to change anything with your release or you want to try some new releases, that's like Gabe was saying, you got to do that stuff right now. Yeah. You do not want to be going out there the, and buying a new release a week before elk season starts and thinking you're going to be the baddest mamma jamma in the woods with this brand new release. Because I'm telling you right now, it can bite you and it can bite you hard. A release, it, it, I, I'm going to argue and say it's probably the most important thing. Because it's it's what directly connects you to the string that's letting that arrow go. And like John was saying, if you're off just a little bit or slap that trigger at 50 yards, you might be a half a foot off. You might miss a whole target. You can miss a whole elk from slapping the trigger. Yep. And so that's one thing you really got to, you know, focus on and start really honing your routine and getting to where, you know, it's second nature. You're, you're not pulling at that trigger. You're not grasping for it. You're not smacking at it. And you're just relaxed and you just, you know, breathe into it, let it surprise you. And that's one of those things. I mean, anybody who shot a, you know, shot rifles or guns, you know, they'll kind of be familiar with the, you know, letting the trigger surprise you to get a good shot. And it's pretty much the same thing. Just, a, you know, it's just a little different. But I will say that personally, I don't think back tension releases, like most people probably don't need to hunt with them because it's very easy. If you don't pull that thing back just exactly right, you're, it comes unlocked and you will punch yourself in the nose. I've seen it happen. I've almost had it happen to me before. Like it is one of those things that I just take consideration in that. That's all I'm saying. So. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, I may stick to my old wrist strap and just, you know, it's a, it's an amazing thing is a sort of a new archer. Like I can tell exactly when the arrow comes off the bow that it's going to be a good shot. And it's just because everything feels right now. Stringing ten of those together, I'm I've done her once or twice, but I mean that's the that's the goal for the summer is just to have that every time. Um, you know, John, I was yep. going to say, you know, one thing to consider, especially on elk hunting, to me, is it's such a different experience, right, than what we're used to on turkeys and deer. 
you know, you're in a blind, you're in a tree stand. That's pretty much where most of the, the archers are have that experience. Elk hunting, you're on the ground, you're moving, you got a lot of stuff going on. And I personally like the wrist strap because it's on my wrist. I know exactly where it is during the hunt the whole time. I don't want to be fumbling for that, you know, that, that release in my pocket or where did I put it or did I drop it? You know, I've got enough stuff dangling around my neck and on my, you know, with calls and, and packs and all that stuff. So I just like the fact that it's tied to me. I'm not going to lose it. It's right there. I know where it is all the time. It's kind of a pain in the butt to carry it around all day, but to me, it's, it's worth the effort just to know that it's there and it's, it's easy for me to have access to it. Yeah. You got it on. I mean, why, you know, if you're hunting in any manner, then why not, why not be ready to ready to shoot? And that makes a lot of sense to me for sure. And if you're going to be heading to the woods, if you've got an extra one, always pack it in your bag. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Don't want to get all the way out there and put that much time and money invested into this and moment of truth comes and it ain't there or it breaks. So. Yep. And, and, and to take on that moment of truth and it's there, <laughs> You know, for me, and I always have my bow in my hand. If it's daylight, I've got my bow in my hand. I don't care if it's noon or 90 degrees or the you know prime first 30 minutes of daylight, I've got a hold of it. Because as soon as you strap that thing to your backpack and you go walking, you're going to have an opportunity and you're not going to have the abilities to shoot. So, you know, do not put that thing on your back unless it's dark or you're packing one out. Awesome. Awesome. All right, so let's. I, I think this is going to play a little bit into our broadhead discussion. But talk to me about tuning a bow, and if if that like, you know, ways ways somebody could do it at home just to check. I mean, what I've I've really in my I've got a somewhat mechanical mind. I've not really figured out what tuning a bow is, uh, and I've watched I've watched a lot of YouTube on it. So give me give me the quick and give me the quick and dirty. So tuning a bow is basically optimizing whatever arrow, broadhead, uh, release, sight, rest, all that stuff. It's, it's optimizing all that stuff to work as good as it can together. And it's like archery is very finicky. And if one piece doesn't cooperate just right, the whole thing's not going to work right. And it's like, I mean, you know, you have one thing kind of get off a little bit, a little bit, it's going to throw everything off. And so one thing I'm going to say is, if you have you 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 all have the opportunity to go archery elk hunting, it's not a cheap endeavor. It's it's not something you get to do every year. Most people, and personally, if if I'm in that position, I'm not going to risk anything by by skimping a corner and trying to just you know do it at home. Which you can you can definitely tune your stuff up at home. But I'm saying I would probably prefer to go to an archery shop have them help me tune my bow to me because they know exactly what they're doing they do this all the time and that way you know it's just peace of mind but if you do want to tune your bow at your house there's you know there's there's some good resources and stuff on you know youtube and stuff you know some of the for the hunting forums and stuff but because there's there's a, a bunch of different ways you can tune a bow and get to a certain point and you can kind of cross reference some of those tuning. So, I mean, you have like paper tuning, uh, walk back tuning. If you're building your own arrows, you can do bear shaft tuning. I mean, there is a ton of ways you can tune a bow and they all get you to the same place. But that's one of those things like, if you're not gonna have an archery shop tune your bow, I would at least reach out to an archery shop and maybe ask them some questions. Maybe, you know, and say, you know, hey, I've got this going on, you know, how can I correct this? And it's like, you'll know. And it's like, if you've had your bow set up before and you know it shoots dead on and, you know, every time you're just shooting good and everything just feels good, you probably don't need to mess with tuning it. But if there's something that's just not right, like say you're just having something that's just, just not going right, you know, it just feels off or something's just not right, you may need a little bit of tuning. And, you know, it can, it can help, absolutely. And it's one of those things, like I said, I personally, if you have this big opportunity and you're going to try and harvest an elk, I would let a professional handle that and just give me that peace of mind that if I have that big elk in my sights, I know everything's right. I can't, I don't have to look back and say, well, did I do this? Did I do that? Did I tighten this? You know, you don't have any of that playing in your mind. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and say, but... I would also recommend don't run to the archery shop as soon as something seems off. 
is I always try to use the, the you know, the two times in a row. So some days you just don't got it. You know, you, you go out and you're off. Don't think it's the bow and run and start messing with things. Put the bow down, go in the house, do something different, forget about it and come back later that evening or tomorrow, shoot it again. It could be that it was just you. And then if it's consistently off and it's, and it's consistent, then start playing, but don't, don't chase things uh, right off the bat. Just, you know, work on it. hundred percent. And one thing I'll say just to kind of follow that up. And this has been, I don't remember who told me this, but long ago, somebody told me this and it has made me a way better archer. Everybody, you know, you see people all the time, they go to practice, they're shooting volleys of 10, 15 arrows. Don't do that. Shoot three to four arrows in a volley, which a volley is, you know, you shoot three or four arrows, walk down and get them. Because what happens is, and when I was younger, I would do this. I'd have every arrow I have, and I'd want to shoot them all at the same time and then run down there and get them. And, you know, but what happens is you get tired. And you may not realize you're tired, but you're tired. And once you get to that third or fourth, fifth arrow, whatever, however many, and you start to get tired, you're going to start making bad shots. And all you're doing every shot after that is you're reinforcing bad habits. So I like to do three, I shoot volleys of three shots, go down, retrieve my arrows, take a little rest, you know. And that's why I like to shoot with somebody. I know me and Joe used to do this all the time. We would we would both shoot our three arrows, we'd walk down, and we'd alternate who shot first. And that way the other person has a rest and, you know, you get to rest. And so your, your form stays good and you'll start to, you know, you'll, you'll solidify those good habits. Because it's very easy if you, you know, want to shoot a, a large volume of arrows really quickly that you can introduce some bad habits and really throw a wrench in yourself. I mean, you can really, you can get some weird wonky things going on that are hard to correct. Because once you get a bad habit, it's very hard to correct. Yeah. So when you're, when you're shooting, also shoot how you're going to hunt. So, you know, I know a lot of, a lot of whitetail hunters, they take, they've got a removable um, quiver take the quiver off, hang it in a tree. Most of the time with elk hunting, that quiver is going to be on your bow. Um, I know mine stays on when I'm elk hunting. So shoot that bow like you're going to shoot it when you're hunting. So elk hunting, the quiver is going to stay on. Practice with the quiver on. That's going to feel different. It's going to lean one way. You're going to want to cant. And, I'll put, and so that's going to affect things. So that's the things you need to be thinking about when you're shooting is, how am I going to hunt? And then you need to try to replicate that as close as you can in those practice sessions. That makes sense. All right, so we've been we've been hitting the uh, the vertical bows here pretty hard, but uh, kind of moving into the crossbow section. And what I want to remind folks is we've got a we've got a concurrent archery crossbow season. Mm -hmm. If you've got the the either sex archery tag, uh, you can use a crossbow all days of the season. It's 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 completely concurrent. Your choice essentially. Um, and I think at least a couple of people that I've talked to this week that were talking archery stuff, I asked them about a crossbow and they weren't sure it was legal. It is definitely legal uh, for elk hunting in Kentucky. So I think, you know, this is, you know, in the outfitter and guides that we talked to in the, in the second episode really hit on this. It's a good tool uh, for, for elk hunting in Kentucky. If you're on the fence, um, you know, or maybe haven't, haven't really, stayed on your archery game the last couple of years it can be a pretty viable option so just uh talk to us about that you kind of your experiences with that over the last couple of years i'll throw yeah, it I out could, there any of you I, I was gonna say i can jump in if you want and kind of kick things off too yeah. um so you know any crossbow that's good for whitetail would work for elk a lot of the same things that we have we talked about apply as far as uh the weight of the setup um I think the biggest thing that a lot of folks don't think about is the, your broadhead choice. So one, you need to make sure you purchase a broadhead that's rated for crossbows. Just the regular old broadhead would work potentially, but it might not handle, especially if it's one of these newer crossbows that are extremely fast and a lot of poundage. They just can't handle the speed. And then when you when they hit the impact, they just fall apart. So make sure you look at a, at, at a crossbow bolt or that crossbow broadhead. Um, the other thing to, to make sure, and we didn't really touch on this on, on vertical bows, but shoot that broadhead. You know, if you're going to use a mechanical or a fixed blade, shoot it and make sure that that, that bow or that crossbow 
shoots it the same way as it does a field point. You spend the effort, waste a few of those real uh, broadheads. Sometimes they come with a target broadhead, but uh, shoot those. So that's one thing I think you need to think about. Also, some of the crossbows are kind of heavy, can be a little cumbersome to hold in that, that position. So go look at some shooting sticks, whether it's a bipod, tripod, monopod, what, what makes sense. Uh, think about that. And then also most of them come with a scope. A lot of them come with a lighted scope of some sort, a red dot or lighted, lighted reticles, uh, extra battery. I don't know how many times people go yeah. to the field and they forgot the battery. And so having that extra battery there, a lot of times that battery will cross-reference with your range finder. So just look at your setup. Those would be my first three things I would think about is battery for my, for my sight, broadhead, and rest, and, and a way to hold the bow for a, a long time. Yeah, and just thinking about mechanics of calling in an elk. I mean, everybody, everybody uh, is more familiar with calling in a turkey. And it's the same way, you know, if you're shooting a vertical bow, you've still got to get drawn on that animal. Uh, in you know, when they're relatively close, depending on how fast they're moving to you. And a crossbow is, is just that it's drawn, it's ready to go. You're, you're going to be more like you're shooting your turkey gun at a turkey, uh, than actually drawing a bow on it. So I think that's a, that's something to think about. I see it as a, as a pretty good advantage, um, going into, going into an elk hunt, but, but definitely something for a hunter to, to think about and be figuring out now. Cause I'd want to, I'd want to be shooting a crossbow as much as I was shooting a vertical bow over the course of the summer, just to be, yeah. just to be comfortable with it. I think, uh, you know, I, I, again, I am not the most experienced crossbow guy. I actually bought one for my father when he was drawing for his cow archery tag, I don't know, five years ago, but um, I, I do think it's a better tool. Now you still need to practice and make sure you know what it does, but I do think it's a better tool if you don't have the ability to practice as much as would be needed for a vertical bow. Um, but with the crossbow, I think there are other safety considerations you need to make too, right? Like I, when my father and I hunted together, I basically kept it on a sling. Um, I didn't keep it always at the ready. And, and, um, you know, you have to be careful too, like making sure your fingers are in the right position. You know, it's another thing to just a thing to think about, um, when you, when, you know, you're in the moment, um, and, uh, you, you can't always keep it at the ready, but I always tried to um, treat it, treat it like I would a firearm or the bow. And I, I didn't typically keep it. Uh, well, I didn't keep it drawn uh, while we're walking through the woods or fumbling. Um, generally I kept it decocked on a, on a sling um, until we were in a situation where we were, you know, either waiting for the elk to come out or calling uh, what have you. But um, that's just, my two cents on it. It's a great tool and it definitely gives some people who don't have the ability to practice as much or, or the capability to pull a bow back, you know, of sufficient poundage. Um, I think it definitely gives them a, a really good option and it, and it, it does ex extend your range and it's a, it's a fine tool. Yep. Well, let me touch, can I touch on, well, Joe, Joe has a perfect segue and then I'll let you go, Kenton. So range. Now, hunter ethics play comes into play. If you, if you're a crossbow guy and you read the the magazines, you know you know shoots like a rifle at 100 yards. Just because it can do that on a bench in a controlled setting does not mean that you can go out there in the field and shoot that distance. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, my my six and a half Creedmoor will shoot a thousand yards, and, but I'm not going to shoot that far in an animal. And so, be thinking of that. Just because it can do it, one doesn't mean it's right. And two, it, you might not have enough force to actually penetrate the animal to be lethal. So really, to me, a crossbow, its same lethal range, lethal distance is very similar to an elk or to, to a vertical bow for elk that, you know, you don't want to be shooting at 60, 70, 80 yards at an elk. I mean, that's just that's just crazy to think about. They're a big animal. We don't want to be out wounding these things. So just because the equipment can do it and they advertise it doesn't mean you need to be out there shooting it and, and letting them go at that distance. Yeah, that's, a, Sorry, that's what I was going to say. Okay, I was good. I say the same thing because I, when I worked at the archery shop, I'm telling you right now, people be like, oh man, I want this new crossbow and like, I'm going to shoot deer at 100 yards. And I'm like, no, you're not. Because <laughs> just because they shoot these feet per second and stuff does not mean that it's more, it's, I, I tell everybody, your crossbow and my vertical bow probably have the same lethal range. 
to be yeah. honest with you, all things considered. Mm -hmm. And I, that pretty much holds true. But it, uh, another thing I'd like to touch on, because I've, you know, dealt with people having some issues with crossbows and had to help people kind of figure some stuff out. Um, a lot of times crossbows, when you're shooting a fixed broadhead, a fixed blade broadhead, which is what I would recommend to shoot up with, they're going to shoot different than the field point. So I, su I suggest that everybody sights in their crossbow with exactly what you're going to be shooting at an elk. Go ahead, do that. Another thing, I people have come to me with consistency issues. Man, my crossbow would just, you know, it'll shoot real good and then it'll shoot way to the left or shoot way to the right or, you know, it'll shoot kind of weird. Well, then the first thing I ask them, are you using the cocking aid, the, the device, you know, all crossbows come with a device that uh, basically clips on the string, has two handles or, you know, there's cranks, there's, there's a bunch of different cocking aids, but make sure you use a cocking aid. I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody be like, well, no, I'll just reach down there and grab the string and pull it up and just shoot the thing. Well, there's a lot of issues with that. Number one, one of your arms is probably longer than the other one. It may not be by a lot, but like I said, with that whole pieces of the puzzle and tuning stuff, if, if you're off just a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left and that string's not perfectly centered, it's going to throw that shot off a lot. And when you get out there to 50 yards, that amount that it throws a shot off can be a tremendous amount. So one thing you want to always make sure is that you use your cocking aid and you make sure to, you make sure, you know, you get in a rhythm. It's just like drawing back your bow. You want to get in a rhythm with, with uh, drawing back your crossbow and getting it set up and everything. And that way, that'll help you build consistency. And a crossbows can be very, very accurate. I'm talking about they can be deadly accurate if you do that and make sure the way that you're drawing that crossbow is the same every time and, uh, you know, build that repetition. Yeah, makes sense. So really, I mean, I guess in my mind, I have it that I could go and buy a crossbow and roll out and hunt, but that's not the, that's not the case. You need to be, need to be practicing. So we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but let's talk about arrows. And then we're going to segue into the, into the big topic that I want to hit on is, is broadheads, which we had a good, good lively discussion about it with the elk guides. Um, and, and, Kenton, you mentioned this earlier that it's all speed, speed, speed. I mean, there were, you know, when I was buying my bow back in the fall, there was arrows in there that were just tiny, micro diameter mm -hmm. arrows, super light. Um, and at the same time, I mean, I bought I bought my bow from a place that's, I mean, it's whitetail country in West Kentucky. It's pretty much everybody coming in there is, is whitetail hunting, and that's all good. Uh, just run us through a couple of things to think about on, you know, if you're starting from scratch or you're wondering maybe what the arrows you've got are, like some just some parameters, some things to think about uh, really for a better elk setup. So some things I would think about, number one is weight. So the weight of your projectile is going to equal, it's going to, it's going to calculate out to more penetration. The heavy, a heavier arrow is going to have more penetration than a lighter arrow. That's just, I mean, that's physics 101, basically. So you're, you know, you're not shooting a whitetail, you're shooting an elk. Elk are enormous. They're huge animals. If you've never been up close to one, I'm telling you they're magnificent. It's crazy. <laughs> I think of like a horse, basically. They're like a small horse. Okay. And it's like, think about a horse. And it's like, you don't want to be shooting at, a, at something like that with what you shoot at a little whitetail deer with. It's just not, you know, most people's whitetail setups are not going to be ideal for elk now could they kill elk absolutely probably could but i know if i'm in this position and i'm gonna have my chance to kill me a nice elk with my bow i'm gonna bump up that arrow weight because i want penetration elk are very thick they're very big animals you know and you want that good penetration so arrow weight is something i would i would pay attention to another thing like john was saying they make these arrows these days that are micro skinny little thin things and that can be a good thing and a bad thing. Some of them are really thin and very light, and that can be an issue with penetration. But there are some arrows out there that are very thin, but also very heavy. And those work really, really well. Because what they do for you is that smaller surface area on that uh, arrow is going to help you counteract crosswinds. And it's like, it may not seem like much, but I'm telling you, a crosswind and I've seen it, you know, shooting my own arrows, that little thinner diameter can sometimes really make a huge difference when you're shooting in the wind. And also when your arrow impacts an animal, 
that's less surface area, so that's less drag. So that can equal more penetration as well. And so, you know, those are a few things. And then another thing that uh, a lot of people are talking about these days are your, your weight front of center. Mm-hmm. And FOC. That's, yeah. yeah. And that's a, that's a complicated, it's a, it's a really complicated thing, but basically, <laughs> it is, you know, basically the more you're, you want an F, the more, front of center weight that you have, it's going to increase penetration. It's going to lead to better penetration and stabilization of your, uh, of your projectile, which is your arrow or your bolt or what have you. So, I mean, those are some things that I would, you know, take a look at if it was me, you know, gearing up and getting ready to go hunt out. Those are things I'm going to sit down and, you know, kind of take a deep dive into and look around at and see if there's anything worth changing about my setup that I have currently. Yeah. So one, Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, so to kind of build on his, just an example for mine, I'm shooting, uh, I think my total arrow weight's about 500 grains right now. Um, but, you know, the bow I've got, it's not a, it's not a crazy expensive bow, um, but it, it was advertised it could shoot like 330 feet a second with, uh, you know, that's with like the lightest equipment possible, right? Um, you know, my setup, it's fairly heavy. It's not on the over heavy side, but it's about 500 grains. And I'm still shooting 285, the 290 uh, with mine, which is, is more than sufficient, um, you know, to, to do the job. And, you know, I, you know, say so Kenton did build my bow set up for me and uh, helped me take my elk. But, you know, I, I use that same setup here here for whitetails and it does well, too. So I don't really ever have to transition. Um, but I just started heavy and it's, it's been a pretty good combination for me. One other term that you'll hear a lot too is spine, the spine of your arrow. So it has to do with how much weight you're pulling and how much the broadhead weighs. And you want to make sure that you have the correct spine. So when you look on the bo- back of the box of your arrows, it'll it'll have kind of a diagram, you know, weight, draw length, all that stuff to where you will make sure you fall in that gap when you purchase that arrow. It has the right the right spine. And what if you're if you're if you are too thin in your spine, it'll cause that arrow to wobble as it as it goes through the air. So just, you know, the force of pushing that that arrow forward with all that weight and that speed, uh, you need, you know, the right thickness. And to, to take that even further, I had seen and heard of horror stories is of people trying to shoot. They want faster, faster, faster. And they want with a lighter arrow that had too light of a spine for their draw length and bow and broadhead combination. And what can happen is under that pressure of you releasing your arrow, those arrows can snap in the middle. And I mean, I'm sure most people have seen it. You can Google it. Somebody with a splintered arrow through the hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of catastrophic things that can happen when you shoot under spined arrows. So that's one thing. And something I'll tell you, because some people may think, well, I want to jump up to 125 grain broadhead from 100 grain broadhead that I hunt deer with, make sure you check your arrow specs and that that with that 125 grain broadhead, you're still within the specs for the spine of the arrow that you're shooting. Because you don't want to jump up and shoot that 125 grain arrow or a broadhead and have that, uh, you know, arrow fracture and, uh, you know, damage you or your bow. I was going to say, if you've not done so, you can just go to, go to Google and slow-mo an arrow in flight, especially. I mean, it's really cool. Most people don't realize that arrow is not just straight and rigid. It's wobbling and then it stabilizes through flight, especially when it comes out of that bow. So when you see that, it kind of like the light bulb moment. Like, ah, I understand why we're talking about all these things because it it's all on the stabilization of how quick that arrow can go from like this to flying you know, straight and true mm-hmm. out of that bow. Gotcha. A lot of, lot of info. <laughs> already got my head spinning um (laughs) so uh i want to you know we had a pretty spirited conversation with the guides over broadheads and i'll i'll preface this with there are uh probably a hundred great options out there on the market that will kill an elk and i feel like half the time like you know I personally went with what, what Gabe suggested before I bought my bow, ended up with a mechanical head. Uh, that's what I used when I deer hunted. That's what I killed my turkey with. It's great. Uh, I'm very much on the fence about what I would 
go into the elk woods with. I mean, there's some great advantages to mechanical heads. It shoots, you know, I can, I will tear up my field points if I shoot a field point first and then a, and then a expandable behind it. it they shoot great. Uh, gave me a lot of confidence on turkeys to really be able to hit that small uh, target area. But I think there are, and, and with Kenton saying penetration, I mean, penetration is just that much better with a, with a fixed blade head. That's just physics. They're starting to cut immediately. They don't have to expand, which soaks up energy. And those are kind of the things that I'm looking at with this. And while we're, uh, while we're talking, uh, I'm going to put up, I've got a, I've got a photo of an elk scapula. Um, and when I was working the hunt, uh, you know, years ago when I was doing my graduate work, I always carried one around in the back of my truck, you know, that we'd found from a dead elk. Um, and it is quite the piece of bone. It's not some, you know, there, it, it, you know, a deer scapula doesn't even, you know, there's not too many setups on the market that wouldn't blow through a deer shoulder, but an elk scapula, if you duct tape the piece of wood to it, you could paddle a boat with it. I mean, it's one of those, it's one of those things. Like it's a, it's a big chunk of bone. Um, so I'll share that. And, and really, you know, this one picture I've got, it's got a, you know, I think they were testing out broadheads, shooting them through this scapula. Um, and then the other photo that I've got on, on this one is uh, just essentially where that scapula lays. And we're going to, we'll sort of transition into, into shot placement here pretty quick, but you know, they're in some parts of that scapula and I've got, you know, Gabe and, and Joe and I have cut up a lot of elk, whether we're doing, field necropsies. I mean, we're just curious about this kind of stuff, whether it was for research purposes or just to look and see what's going on in there. Um, you know, it's a lot of bone. There's, there's parts of the scapula that are four inches thick of solid bone. Uh, nothing's, it doesn't matter what you're shooting, fixed or expandable, they're not getting through that. Um, I think you can hedge your bets a little bit bigger, you know, a little bit better. Um, I think when you look at how wide an elk is, you've got that much more that you want to get through. I mean, I want to, ideally, I want a perfect pass through. And, and so uh, just kind of talk to me a little bit about some of the things to be thinking about. I mean, it's that penetration that we need. We want to get both lungs. We want to get uh, an exit hole. So we've got two places that are making blood to blood trail. Um, so Hit me, hit me with some with some knowledge on that, and maybe talk about what what you went to the elk woods with. I, I give this one to Joe off the bat. All right. Um, I mean, personally, I prefer a uh, fixed blade broadhead. Like you said, you don't lose any of that energy when that expandable goes in and starts its cut. Um, I know people who've killed a lot of elk with them. I know people. I mean, I've personally shot them for a long time for, for whitetails, but, um, you know, for me, I, I just want something that I know is always going to work. Um, that kind of what comes down to, to me and it starts cutting on contact and, um, you know, I would feel a little more comfortable shooting this fixed blade broadhead, um, you know, in, in different shot scenarios. Um, but, but personally it's, I, I always know it's going to work. I mean, that's where I always have, fall back on um, when I'm using a fixed blade. I mean, I've, oh. No, I'll go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in. So John already alluded. So I shoot mechanicals. Um, I, I started with fixed blades and then moved to mechanicals. Um, I've done a lot of research on them and shot a lot of game with them. And, you know, I've, I've shot all my oak with a mechanical. Um, I think for me, there are a couple things that I think about is I want a very tried and true, heavy duty mechanical if I'm going to go that route. And I don't want this big, you know, two and a half inch cut, thin little pieces of metal. I want a solid, you know, made solid structure. I did a lot of research, shot a lot of stuff, you know, and, and you can take the deep dive on YouTube on people shooting different things and in gels to look at them and their performance. Um, so I, I think that's the biggest thing is think about what it is and go look at it, look at it, how it opens up. If you want to shoot a mechanical, um, you know, if, as a Western hunter, I, I, I'm prepared to shoot farther distances. So I want that to fly good. Um, and I just, I like them. Uh, I've been really, really happy with the performance, but I'm shooting a still a smaller cut. You know, I, I shoot a, th a three blade 
it's an inch and an eighth uh, or an inch and three eighths. So it's not a big cut, but it's three blades and it, it penetrates very well. So, you know, I don't, I don't think any of us are going to be here saying you need to go get the, you know, the, the, the top of the line, two blade, two and a half inch cut broadhead. I mean, that is not a smart decision. Would it kill an elk? Yes. But, you know, you've got a lot of bone structure and, and you're off just a little bit and you smack a rib, you're not going to more than likely get that animal. You don't want to, you, you don't want to go out there with your two and a half inch cut whitetail broadhead and, and, and try and harvest an elk. I mean, like Gabe said, can you do it? Yes, it can be done. But why not go ahead and give yourself the best chance possible? And like, you know, like Gabe said, there's mechanicals on the market that are good that can get the job done. Like Joe said, you know, hey, um, a fixed blade broadhead, it cuts on contact. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of pluses to that. And, it, you know, it's good. And you don't have to worry about it. You know, if, if it touches animal, it's cut. You know it. You know it's going to do it. So, um, but one thing I will say, whether you go fixed blade or mechanical, make sure you shoot that through your bow to practice with. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, "Well, you know, I, I got this mechanical, but it, you know, it still don't shoot the way that my bro or my field point shooter." You know, I tried to shoot this uh, fixed blade and I, I couldn't even hit the target at 40 yards with it. And it's like, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And that's when tuning comes in. And one of those things that, you know, I, I've seen people and help people set up their bows where, you know, with the field point, they're both shot one way, but then the desired broadhead that they wanted to use, put it on those arrows. And you, you know, we had to recite the bow in with those broadheads to make sure when they're hunting, they're hitting where they need to be. And it's one of those things that, you know, you just got to take the time and the sacrifice and go ahead and just practice with the gear that you're going to hunt with. And it's, you know, it's very, very important because you don't want to get out there and just screw on some random broadhead and go off thinking you're going to shoot you an elk. I mean, that you know, that can end very bad and end with a sleepless night and maybe some tears and some, you know, empty pockets, you know, a lot of money lost when you could have just spent a little extra money up front got something, practice with it, become very confident with it. And then, you know, I think you're, you know, confidence is key. When it comes to hunting, the more confident you are, the better the outcomes I feel like you have. And that's just me speaking from my years of experience like hunting. When I feel comfortable and confident in my gear, I, I perform way better. And I know that when I get that opportunity, I'm going to take advantage of it. And, you know, to the best of my ability. And so, you know, I just think that's that's probably the most important thing I can say, whether you go fixed blade or mechanical, just make sure you practice with what you're going to hunt with. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I, and I will tell you, I mean, this is one of those, I, I try to stir up this discussion uh, a little bit just because it's that interesting to me. Um, there are absolutely great resources on YouTube, like Gabe said. I mean, I watched I watched some dudes in Alabama that shot every type of expandable broadhead on the market through a steel uh, fuel drum uh, the other night. And then they shot them all through three quarter inch marine grade plywood. And there was an absolute clear difference between ones that broke a blade off going through the plywood and ones that made it through. Um, and so I think, I mean, you really owe it to the elk and you owe it to yourself. Research what you're gonna be using. Um, and just because it's schwacked a couple of deer it might not be the type that is beefy enough to uh, take an elk. Um, so do dig into that research. And like Kenton said, I mean, shoot with it. I mean, I'm, I'm working on making my decision here in the next couple of days, and that'll be all that I shoot uh, probably the rest of the summer. I'm just that kind of guy. It may not, you know, field points for fun, but it really doesn't matter until you're shooting those broadheads. So um dig into it there there is probably collectively uh 250 hours worth of people shooting broadheads into stuff on youtube <laughs> and you know with the with the latest and greatest bows and you know you can probably get as particular as finding somebody that's shooting it with your exact bow and just seeing what that does to them so definitely definitely uh want to put that one out there so our kind of next section that we were going to hit was practice, but I think I think everybody that's been watching this video will understand that in everything that we have brought up today so far, it's been practice, um, and that's that's where I'm at with it. And as Kenton said, confidence confidence comes with practice, um, 
and that's what you want when you when you hit the wood so i think if anybody else has got anything on the practice end of things hit me with it now but if not i think I we, we've hit it I, th I think you've missed a, a couple points to think about yep. now, with the quiver right so that's different than most of our elk hunters put a backpack on most of the time when you're elk hunting you got a pack on you know it can be a big pack small pack but put on the pack you're going to use if you're elk hunting um, and also every elk that i've ever shot has been in a different situation I've shot elk straight uphill. I've shot elk straight downhill. I've shot elk from my knees, from one knee, you know, at a weird angle where I'm standing on a 45 trying to shoot uphill. So there are so many different ways and you're in so many different environments and habitat types that all that is different. I remember uh, on the one elk that I shot straight up this kind of cliff line, I had never shot uphill before. And it was an odd, like, how do I aim and kind of get things up here? So Try to think about that in your practice and put yourself in those situations the best that you can, you know, elevate your heart rate, run around a little bit. You mean your heart's going to be pumping. You're going to be up and down the mountains more than likely. Try to replicate that. Think about all those things. So put the pack on, put the quiver on, be in different habitat types, shoot from your knees, shoot from the knee, you know, one knee, single knee, and all those different ways. And that'll help you be better prepared when that opportunity comes because you're not going to have it 20 yards and out of a tree stand in most of the game. Yeah, I personally do a lot of the same things. Uh, I mean, Gabe told me, uh, run around the house two or three times, get your heart rate up, and then try and shoot it. I mean, to me, that was one of the best things that, that I did. Um, just kind of helped me mimic the adrenaline. Um, you know, your body's shaking, you're a little out of breath, just like something's come in. And I think that's a, a perfect example because like we said before 40 yards and he bugles in your face it, it's all uh it, <laughs> you got to be prepared <laughs> but you try to mimic it the best you can although it's impossible without actually being there yeah yep. and so one thing i'll say is you want you if you're shooting a vertical bow you want pretty much everything you do up until the point you're focusing on that pin and you're going to pull that shot to be muscle memory you want to be doing that so much and have done it so much that you could do it in your sleep. I know right now I could go get my bow, pick it up, close my eyes, pull it back, and get anchored up and feel right, open my eyes, and I know I'm looking right down that peep site, I'm looking right out of the site, and everything's lined up the way it should be because I've done it so much. You want it to be muscle memory, and that'll help you when you get that heart rate elevated, when you get that adrenaline pumping. When you, know, when you get in that game time situation, that's the – that's one of the things that I will tell you that can help you a lot is just make sure that you build that muscle memory. One thing that, uh, me, Kenton kind of showed me this one once, um, you can even practice sitting inside your house. He had a, uh, little machine that, uh, what was that thing called that where you could practice your release? Um, Oh, a little rope, uh, mechanism. I used it. I thought it was pretty handy. Yeah. I can't think of, I could, it's lost my mind, but I mean, you can do the same thing with a rubber band. You can sit there and, and get a big rubber band and pull back and, you know, get right there. But uh, the, you can do it as easy as uh, taking a piece of paracord or a piece of rope, um, probably have to be thinner than paracord, and, uh, you know, wrap it around your thumb, tie it in a loop, wrap it around your thumb, and you can get that release back. And, you know, you'll have to tie it to where it's your right draw length, but you can sit there and get comfortable and just practice anchoring up. And, you know, like building in stuff like that. Like I know when my knuckles right here on that jaw, which I know you can't see because I got a big beard, but uh, my knuckle hits that jaw. And I know like it's just it's where it is and it's right. And it's just you can just tell it's it's one of those things you can just tell when when things are right, you can tell. And building in that reputation rep, repetition helps me get to where I know I can always get it to feel right when I'm in the moment. Yeah. All right, let's move in uh, while we got Gabe with us. He's got to run here in just a little bit, but let's let's move into shot placement on elk because I think this is something that I really wanted to hit, and we may have to we may have to take this a little bit further uh, as we get down the line. But um, I'm gonna share a screen here, and essentially, a lot of the a lot of the graphics and stuff that we pulled in for this little section are from our elk hunting university uh, that you can get to through my profile are off our elk hunting page. So if you need to look at these again uh, in a little better format, go and check that out. And 
we'll roll in here. So, so I'm just going to pitch this right now. I mean, this is the ideal shot. This is, this is about, uh, about 12 yards. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's kind of what I would, what I would ask for. Um, but I will say, and we, I've got a photo of it at the end, uh, an elk doesn't really crab walk to you sideways as he's coming in to your call. Um, and I found that out firsthand uh, with my muzzleloader last year. Um, but talk to me a little bit about shot placement. I've got a couple of different uh, different photos here that we can work through and uh, kind of just let me know which one you want me to point you all to and, and give us your best take on, on shot placement. I'll start with Gabe in case he's got to run. Okay, so uh, you alluded to it already, John. So if you're in September, you're hunting the rut and you're calling and you're working a bull, he's bugling. Most of the time that bull is going to be coming straight to that sound. So you're going to have this, you know, straight on, you know, that that's a perfect, yeah. perfect example, straight on or quartering two shot. And you know, when you look at this this picture to me, you're like, oh, yeah, I can probably slip it in right there, right up against tight on that shoulder. Don't even make that thought. Don't even go there because a quarter inch, quarter inch two shot on an elk is an awful shot. And and so do not take that shot. I mean, that, that is my one of my biggest pet peeves is do not take that shot on quarter and two. So how I'm going to try to prevent that is if I'm hunting by my, if I've got somebody with me, I'm going to have them do the calling and be kind of set off to the side. There are, those elk are going to come to that sound and try to set yourself up to where if you got somebody calling and you're off of like a, at a 90 or 45 from that collar to where that hopefully that elk will be walking to them to the sound and you can shoot a broadside shot. Um, you know, the frontal, that's pretty, pretty common. Um, you know, there are, you, you, this one's a little bit more controversial. There's some archers that like a full frontal shot. It's just a really narrow window for you to, to hit. And it's just not a lot of room for error. And yeah, they're big critters, but I always err on the side of caution. It's just not worth wounding that animal and losing it um, to ruin my experience. Uh, and we need to do these animals justice. So wait for the right opportunity. If you don't have it, chalk it up to, you know, a learning experience and don't, don't push that shot. And they're big. They can go a long way. Even with a lethal shot, they can go a long way. And, you know, it's, it can be a challenge to bring one down. So, you know, I like the broadside quarter in a way. That's my, my two preferred shots. Uh, but the biggest thing for me is do not take this shot you're looking at. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I had the same conundrum uh, with my muzzle loader last year in Colorado. I called it in and he walked straight to me. Um, and so, I had, you know, I wouldn't take a frontal with a bow and I was very much on the fence about taking it with my muzzle loader. And that eventually came down to the fact that he was close enough and I was confident with my equipment to hit what's basically, I mean, you're talking a softball sized area uh, to be able to get that bullet in a frontal and go through the lungs. And that's essentially what the bullet did. Took the plumbing off the top of the heart, went through the lungs and was up against the diaphragm. Um, and I'm much more precise and confident with that muzzle loader than I, than I would be with a bow for sure. Uh, and this, you know, I wouldn't take this shot with, with a muzzle loader at all. I mean, I had a direct like geographically pointed straight at me shot. And that's the only reason uh, that I would even think about that. Um, so that's definitely a good point. So, you know, uh, I was going to say in, in that effort, a lot of times if they're coming, if they pause, they're going to take, take a few steps to the left or take a few steps to the right and just be ready. So be ahead and be drawn. If you've got a mouth call, just an inquisitive cow call back to them when they start to turn can get them to stop and that changes your, your sight window for a shot. So, you know, a bull I killed in Colorado, he came to me all the way straight to me. I never did not have a shot. He was within like eight yards. He spooked and was running away quarter and hard. And I just cow called extremely aggressive and he stopped. And I had a beautiful quarter and away shot and was able to harvest the animal. So be, be thinking about those things. Like this is not the opportunity and watch their movements, watch their behaviors. And as soon as they start to move, go ahead and hit that cow call and that'll stop them. And that should change your alignment and you might have an opportunity for a shot. Yeah. 
All right, sure. Jeff. It's a, one way to ruin an elk hunting trip is to to wound one and lose one. I mean, I'd much rather say, man, I had an awesome encounter. I had this bull this close to me, um, rather than saying, ah, I shot him, I shot him full frontal quarter and two, and I stuck him in the shoulder blade. I hear that all the time. I stuck one, didn't find it. Anybody got a tracking dog? I mean, um, much rather wait for the right opportunity and, and take a clean ethical shot um, than, than risk it and for sure guarantee that you're going to have a, a bad taste in your mouth driving home. Yeah. One of, I mean, one of the things that I studied on before I went to Colorado was just looking at elk. I mean, how many elk have we looked at? Mm-hmm. Sure. But just looking at like the photo I've got up on the right, or actually both of these photos, you know, where the anatomy lays at under there, how that big scapula bone and the humerus lay in there. I mean, they're not straight down. I think that's a pretty common misconception that they're, they're sort of making that zigzag as they go down. Um, and then the thing that gets me on a big bull is there, I mean, there's like four foot of, of, you know, of distance on the side of that elk and it looks so big and it looks so easy, but you actually got a, you know, larger than a deer, obviously, but look at how much of that bull on the photo on the right is, is nothing. You know, you've got a lot of nothingness down low. That's not going to do anything to him. And then up in that shoulder area, you know, you shoot them through the tenderloins, they're going to run into the next County. Um, there's a lot of space on them where, especially with archery equipment, you're not going to have any chance of finding that animal. Um, and I'll speak to, uh, to like some of the work that I did in graduate school. Um, so we had a bunch of elk GPS collared and my, my number one question was how do they die? Um, and so we had a fair number of elk that were lost uh, to wounding loss from, from archery hunters. And the strange thing, it's not strange, it makes perfect sense. In every one of those situations, it was a bad shot. Um, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a gut shot. It was a lot of the frontal shots where that arrow just simply went down a shoulder, went down you know, between the skin and the ribs and maybe lodged in their hip. Um, and that is just the, that, that, that is you know, kind of my cautionary tale with some real world experience in terms of taking that frontal shot. If you're off or right or left two or three inches, hit that scapula, it's gonna deflect the arrow out and send it, send it, you know, just basically through the shoulder and you're not gonna hit any vital organs whatsoever. Um, and you know, it didn't matter, it, you know, it didn't matter expandable or fixed blade. It was just a bad shot that shouldn't have been taken. And I think with archery hunters, a lot of, a lot of the time the elk is gonna to present to you is going to present that frontal shot and they're going to be at 10 or 12 yards and it's going to be incredibly tempting because he's bugling uh you know he's got snot running out of his nose and that that just i i just you know think we need to be cautious about that shot because and and joe and i have darted a couple hundred of these things with dark guns for my project they will always i mean there's there's very few that i can think of in all the years out there chasing these things that they didn't at least kind of cock that front end around and give you a quarter and a way shot um, where you could, you know, get them. Of course, we weren't shooting them in the rib cage with the, with the dart gun, but they always gave you a good shot 99% of the time. And that's something that just a little, we just learned through what we were doing a little bit of patience um, makes that happen. So here's the, you know, here's one other photo on this one that I'm going to let Joe talk about it uh, a little bit, but this kind of, this is just kind of drawn in where that scapula is and uh, just has some, I think this was on a, on a forum that I found a couple years ago, just like basically asking which one of these little dots would you shoot at, but it shows this shows where that scapula lays, where it lays at an angle. And you definitely want to avoid that thing, especially with archery equipment. And then again, the, the kind of quartering two frontal shot, this is, this is worst case scenario. I mean, anything outside of a, uh, you know, a Magnum elk rifle, you just don't need to be taking this shot. There's a lot of structure right here um, and not really a good way to get an arrow where you're going to get a double lung hit or, or get, a, get, a, get the heart. So Joe, you got anything more? Gabe had to run on, uh, on shot placement, ethics, uh, distance. 
Uh, in terms of ethics, distance uh, goes back to knowing your equipment, knowing what you're capable of, um, knowing what your gear is capable of. And, and kind of like Gabe touched on earlier, just because it says you can do it doesn't mean you need to. I mean, for for me, uh, I know Gabe is more more comfortable shooting a bit further, but I kind of set a limit on myself of 45 yards. That's about what I want, uh, even on an elk where it's big. I mean, I know I practice out to 60 or 70 and I can do well, but um, there's just too much variation, uh, too much environmental uh, things that, that can occur, um, especially in like low light conditions, right? You might not be able to to see, like in my case, when I killed my bull, uh, he was perfectly broadside, 35 yards, and I hit a little bitty twig about two feet in front of him that I didn't see. Um, you know, if he was a little bit further, that, that shot could have went from a kill shot to a, a really bad shot. Um, You've also got, you know, things like wind that, that move your arrow or push your arrow. Um, just your own your own um, nervousness. I mean, you know, we try to practice and be in our rhythm and, and have everything right. But, you know, you might you might jerk the trigger a little more than you normally do or, or something like that. So there is a lot that, that can happen between you releasing that arrow or firing that bolt and it actually reaching the animal. Um, yep. So know your, know your limitations um kind of have them firmly set in your mind and like we talked about uh, wounding earlier you know i'm i would rather come home and be like man kenton john i had a freaking awesome time i didn't kill him i had this right i called this bull in i could have shot this cow but you know i had a great experience with them in the woods i didn't let an arrow fly but i didn't want to risk ruining that animal so just have those things in your mind and and stick to them that's a that's an important part don't you know, when the time comes, don't just sit there and say, ah, I can do it, you know. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing that I've always, uh, whether I'm proud of myself about it or not, I've always got that max range. Uh, when we were pronghorn hunting in Nebraska, 400 yards, max range. I'll take it at, at 399 and, but not 415. You know, I'm good to four. That's max range. Uh, my muzzleloader in Colorado last year, I had a hard 100 yard max. That was a hard range that I went into that with. And that, that was where I was good, but anything past that, I tried at 125. I tried at 150 throwing too many variables into it at that point with, with the muzzle or hard 100 yard. And so definitely, we, you know, we get in the woods with the, with the bows this fall, I'm going to have that hard limit and it's probably going to be, you know, it, it, I don't think it's going to be over 40 for me right now. And it might be 30 and just have that hard limit. It makes it easy when you've got your mind set. It makes it real easy to pass on a shot you're not comfortable with if it's too far. Just mm -hmm. mentally, just justifying it with yourself. You might be out there by yourself and no one's ever going to know that you pass that up under what circumstances you've got to live with it yourself. Uh, so having that, having that limit, I think has always been something since I was, you know, since I was younger that, that I've, I've liked that. I know the parameters and I know I'm good to that limit. So if they're inside, you know, I'm confident I can get them. If they're out of that, not even going to try. Yep. Um, get so, on tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one thing, and you know, this might be for another, this might be for another uh, episode, but just to point out some stuff that we've got, I think this is exceptionally important for archery hunters, stuff we've got on Elk Hunting University. Uh, this is just one example, blood trail in an elk, you know, the type of blood to look for on your arrow. Uh, we've, we've got some really good graphics here, a chart up at the top. This, this is, you know, walking through Elk Hunting University, this is the kind of stuff you're going to get and it's real good stuff. Um, I know, Joe, when you were in Colorado, you had a pretty good tracking job on that elk, possibly because of the, the you know, the stick that deflected things. But yep. e either way, I've seen them, I, you know, I've seen big tracking jobs come with a 300 wind mag. Um, so it just, it kind of depends on the elk. They're big, tough critters, and they got four foot legs and can be up the side of a mountain before, you know, a double lung is going to take them down. Um, so hit me with a couple things. Uh, just on tracking and then we'll uh we'll close things out and uh kind of see what we've what we need to pick up and hit on another video yeah for me it's just uh making sure you can find that arrow seeing what evidence it gives you what it can tell you um you know it's all gonna all gonna make a difference in 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 your next response right um 
you know, we all want to see that nice bubbly blood, you know, it indicates a double lung shot or a lung shot. Uh, I'm assuming double lungs if you found the arrow, but, uh, you know, we all want to ideally see something like that. And, um, you know, the last thing we want to see is, uh, the bottom right, the gut shot, right. That's, uh, that's kind of the worst case scenario, but, um, just kind of make sure you give the animal the appropriate amount of time. Right. I mean, even if I double lung, lung one, I'm, I'm not going to run right to it immediately. Right. Like give it an hour, give it some time to dive. If I've got a gut shot or something, I shoot him in the afternoon, I'm probably not going to go back to that animal until the next morning until, you know, nine or 10. Um, I mean, it takes them a while to, to pass from, from poor shots. Um, you know, liver shots can, are going to be fatal, but it's going to take them six, seven hours to die. Um, so just really pay attention to, to what, what you've got here, what you find on your arrow, what you find on the ground. Um, and if you, you know, do happen to bump him, back off, let him go a while back down. Um, that's, that's about what I got. I mean, this is something that's pretty familiar concept to, to most whitetail hunters. I mean, I guess the thing I would tell you um, is give them more time. You know, we've touched on it. They are huge, huge animals. Um, you know, you, you might double lung and put it right through the center of the top of the lungs. It's going to take a lot of time for that cavity to start filling up with blood where you really get, um, a good blood trail. I mean, it happens with whitetails, but it can be even longer with elk just because they are so big. So, um, just don't rush it. See what you've got here. Um, and, and make your best effort to, to recover that animal. Awesome. All right. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a curveball at everybody. Give me your, uh, give me your closing thoughts on this, on this whole subject of, of archery elk hunting and we'll kind of go around and, uh, and close her out. All right. Uh, start, Ken. Yeah, I'll start it. That's fine. So my closing thoughts are going to be practice, 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 prepare for the worst, hope for the best. If you're prepared for just about any situation you can think of, then when you get out there and you're doing the real thing, you, you're probably going to be very successful. But people do it all the time, man, ill-prepared. They don't take the time and do the preparation work to, to know, give themselves the best chance possible. I mean, you can be the luckiest person on earth and you can go out there and, you know, call a big elk in, have him coming right in or whatever. But if you didn't take the time to prepare and, you know, get your equipment ready and stuff, you might get that shot of a lifetime. You might get that seven yard broadside shot, but if you didn't practice and prepare, you can miss that elk. I don't care if he is at seven yards, you can miss that elk. So, you know, that's one, that's one of those things, you know, just practice, 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 prepare, prepare, prepare. I mean, this is one of those things, you know, if it's me and I'm going on archery elk hunt this uh, fall, I'm shooting the bow every day. Now, like I said, don't overshoot. Don't shoot 150 arrows in an hour. Don't do that. But one thing I like to do is, you know, Shoot, shoot three volleys of three arrows, go do something, you know, go uh, cook some dinner, go tend to your animals, whatever you got to do, and then come back, shoot three more volleys, stuff like that. But just always prepare and just chip away at it, chip away at it, you know, baby steps, but you'll get there at the end if you take the time and prepare. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you more advantage and it's going to help you be more successful. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'll reiterate, practice, practice, practice. Um, you don't get many opportunities. Archery elk hunting, I mean, most of the Western states average about 10%, and that's including firearm hunting, right? Um, archery's a little less than that. Uh, in Kentucky, we're doing quite a bit better than that, but it's still, um, you know, you don't get an opportunity every single hour, every single day. you got to make sure you're situated, you, you have all your stuff lined out, um, and, and start thinking about it right now while you still got plenty of time to correct it. If you do figure out there's an issue um, for me, my biggest thing is, is, is just going to be the ethics of the shot. Make sure you've um, you're, you're, you know, like we talked about having your, you know, max ranges, whether you're using crossbow, vertical bow, whatever, um, have those max ranges, take the time to, to make a good shot. Don't rush into something. Um, that's, that's the last thing we want. Uh, just we want you to come and enjoy your elk hunting experience here and a uh, surefire way to do it, to, to not enjoy it, is to rush a shot or take a bad shot that you knew you shouldn't take. Um, but that's, that's kind of my thoughts. Well, shot placement, placement hunter ethics. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And and really, you know, my thing, I, I just come down to confidence in my equipment. That's what I want. Um, you know, whether it's my turkey gun, whether it's, um, you know, my deer rifle, it's all sighted in. I know what exactly it's going to do. And I take that confidence with me into the hunt. So it's one thing I don't have to worry about. You know, I'm not worried about where the gun's going to shoot or where the bow's going to shoot. I'm going to worry about what I'm doing. Um, and so that's my big thing is get confident. Um, and then that confidence, I am a firm believer that that confidence in your equipment is what gets it done, you know, is what gets that elk killed. And I, you know, we, um, get confident early. You know, I regret last year preparing for my muzzleloader hunt that I didn't have that thing lined out in, you know, late spring instead of a month before my hunt. There's a lot of other things you're going to be thinking about right before the hunt. You don't want to still be adjusting sights on your bow or, or, sighting in a rifle get that done now it's something you can control get it done before the area draw get rolling uh because you know as we get closer to hunt things are going to get busier um so i'll i'll basically close with that you know i want to remind folks check out elk hunting university that's where we got a lot of our graphics from uh also there is hours and hours worth of stuff on youtube when we get to the broadhead discussion we get the info on bow tuning it's there uh check out that check out the stuff a lot of the discussion forums nowadays on western hunting they've got long discussion threads about what grain arrow to use what what you know what my what should my equipment setup be that's all out there it's just going to take a little time to to digest that a little bit then go, you know, check out your local archery shop. That's where if you've got a bow you haven't touched in a couple of years, that's probably the first place you need to go. Uh, just get that thing dialed. And, uh, you know, so guys, uh, you know, I want to thank Gabe. He had to run. And I definitely want to th thank Kitten. Uh, there's, you know, you're bringing a whole wealth of archery knowledge that, that, you know, we just don't have. I appreciate that. I got a bow I probably need you to look at. Uh, I'll shout at you. I'll but, take a look uh, at it. yeah i appreciate it no i appreciate it so i'm gonna go ahead and uh and share joe and i's contact info i forgot to do that last week but uh either way let us know let us know if this is what you're looking for let us know what other topics we can cover and uh we'll see y'all next week uh not 100 percent sure what the next topic is going to be but i think we're going to have a uh, open question and answer session if we can figure out the technology to pull that off in June, we'll just try to put everybody on here and just have a uh, have a question and answer free for all with the with you know Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Elk Biologists and see see if that see if that works. So, again, uh, Ken and Joe, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.